Hello, investigators, and welcome to Until the End of Time. My name is Veronica. I'm so glad that you chose to join me today. I have a very exciting news update to share with you all. So, without any further ado, let's get right into it. So, I haven't actually made any videos recently. I've been meaning to, but real life has been kind of busy. I got a new uh, summer job, been busy with that. There's also been a new Netrunner set, which is absolutely amazing. I just wanted to mention that. If you're at all interested in Netrunner, go over to Null Signal Games and check it out. I'll put a link in the description. But there were two bits of Arkham news to print and play investigators, which is actually kind of a lot in the last little bit. Because it's been kind of dry in Arkham News for a couple of months now. There hasn't been that much. The two print and play investigators came pretty close to one another. So that kind of picked it up. And I've been meaning to make a video about those two. And I will be talking about them in this video. However, we got a new expansion announced. Uh, the Feast of Hemlockville will be the next expansion. It will be released in the campaign and investigator expansion split, as we've seen with Edge of the Earth and Scarlet Keys and the re-releases. And we know that it is scheduled to release January, February of next year. So that's 2024, if you're somehow watching this video a decade in the future. <laughs> this uh, is going to be a while to wait, but on the other hand, what we got is very exciting, and I think everybody kind of expected that we wouldn't be getting a expansion before the end of this year at the very least, because just we didn't have a lot of news, and these kinds of releases take time. Like, there's been a big change-up in the FOG team, and I think it just makes sense that, you know, they might need a, a little bit extra time to finish up what looks to be a very exciting expansion. We got two investigators in the expansion article, and let's take a look at them. Starting with Kate Winthrop. Kate has been kind of long anticipated because she's been teased on a number of pretty exciting Seeker cards, including Practice Makes Perfect. And she's also been in Barkham as Kate Winpop. So she's been a long time coming. Uh, we now see what she looks like, and she has she's the scientist, and she has two willpower, four intellect, two combat, and four agility. She is miskatonic and scholar traded. She begins the game with the flux stabilizer inactive side face up. We'll look at what that means in a moment, and then she has this free triggered ability: move one clue from Kate Winthrop to a science or tool asset you control with no clues on it. That's very important. You can only put one clue on your cards this way. And don't worry about soft locking yourself because there's a forced ability when an asset you control with a clue on it leaves play, place a clue on your location. So worst thing that can happen if the, the tool or the science asset that's got the clue on it leaves play, you just drop it, you have to pick it up again, you lose a little bit of tempo. Sure. Okay, why do we want to do this? Well... Uh, oh, sorry, before before we get to the Flux Stabilizer, let me finish reading uh, Kate. So, uh, Alishan Effect plus zero, you may move one clue uh, to the... Uh, sorry, you may move one clue from an asset you control back to Kate Winthrop. Six health, eight sanity. And then the Flux Stabilizer, inactive, permanent. Kate Winthrop uh, deck only, it is item tool and science traded. Forced, after a clue is placed on Flux Stabilizer, search your bonded card or discard pile for one copy of Etheric Current, and shuffle it into your deck. Flip Flux Stabilizer, keeping all tokens and attachments. Now, that's actually, I guess, important to mention. Bonded cards are back for this expansion. It is one of, I believe, two mechanics we know are returning. Uh, more on that in, later in this video. But once you do that, you flip it to the active side. And on the active side, it is still item tool science. It is still permanent. It is still Cape Winter deck only. And it has this reaction. When you place a clue on an asset you control, Get you plus two skill value for your next test uh, skill test this or this phase, so that's kind of cool. Um, I think this is a very interesting new direction for Seeker or new way to play with some of the things that we know uh, in Seeker, which is you have clues. How can you use those clues for other purposes than just advancing the act? And here we see when you put your clues on the flex stabilizer on your other tool and science cards with. Kate's ability, we get plus two skill value for a skill test. That's pretty nice. A free unexpected courage is just a potent effect. And I like that it's not just more card draw. It is helping you pass tests because Kate has a reasonable stat line, but 
only four intellect, which you know, sounds weird, but there are five intellect seekers and two willpower is also kind of on the low side. So this is definitely something to keep in mind with Kate. And I think the ability to use your clues to get extra uh, skill boosts is very nice. Now let's take a look at the Aether Current. We've seen two of them so far. The article doesn't make it explicit whether or not these are the only ones that we will get. Uh, and we don't know our deck building yet. So possibly there's more of them, but possibly these two are it. And what we have is the Yoga version is a zero cost event with a combat icon. It is science traded. It is bonded to the Flux Stabilizer and you can play it only if it is on its active site. You can fight, you move all clues on assets you control to Kate Winthrop. So you move all your clues off your assets back to Kate. For this attack, you may use intellect instead of combat. If you succeed in the attacked enemy is non-elite, you may exhaust it and move it to any location, draw a card and flip flux stabilizer, keeping all tokens in attachment. So this is a pretty neat little effect. It doesn't give you a damage boost and it doesn't give you a skill boost other than using intellect instead of combat but it is kind of an evade right it lets you exhaust the enemy and then move it anywhere else so definitely a powerful effect in solo and that's one of the reasons i think kate might be a pretty powerful solo seeker but yeah i i like it and then the other version that we've seen so far is the etheric current yoth zero cost event agility still bonded, still science traded, play only if it's on its active side, and then evade. Move all clues on assets you control to Kate Winthrop. For this evasion attempt, you may use intellect instead of agility, which is less relevant because she also has four agility, but you might have intellect boosters in Seeker. But if you succeed and the target of this evasion is non-elite, shuffle it into the encounter deck, draw a card, flip flux stabilizer. I like these effects a lot. I think they're very cool. I think they let you do kind of non-seeker things in a very seeker way, which is to say you can use your intellect and you can use clues to kind of move things around. You're not just killing enemies, but it does mean that Kate is a lot more well-rounded than some of the all-in clue-getting seekers that we've seen in the past. Um, and I really like that. The fact that she also can get this plus two skill boost with her uh, clue moving is also quite nice because it also makes her a little bit more flexible. Now, she does, of course, have a signature weakness, the failed experiment. It is a blunder, treachery weakness. And it says, Revelation, test willpower three, which, reminder, she only has two willpower base. This test gets plus one difficulty for each asset you control with a clue on it. That's important because that means that even if you start moving clues to try to push your willpower or you just have clues on stuff in general, it's just going to be more difficult. You need to have some way of passing this test. For each point you fail by, you either take a horror or drop a clue. This is a tough weakness. I don't quite know how to judge it. The thing is that inherently uh, weaknesses with tests on it, I don't think we've seen a lot of. And there is the possibility you use pass and this does nothing. There's also the possibility that you have like a couple of clues on assets and you draw an auto fail and you either take like five horror or have to drop a whole bunch of clues, which is pretty rough. So I think this is a pretty swingy weakness potentially. And one that I am very interested to see how it'll play out. Are Kate deck going to be running more willpower icons, skill cards, just to get around this weakness? Are you somehow trying to manipulate how many clues are on your assets so that when this comes up, you then have a very easy test and then later you can put all your clues on your assets and really start to power up? One thing that the developers have both noticed, uh, noted on Discord and on Reddit is that clues on cards you control are still clues you control. So for the purposes of announcing the act or otherwise spending clues that you control, you can spend the clues that are on Kate's assets, which is important because it means you can also free those up. Remember, her free triggered ability only lets you put clues on assets you don't already have clues on. So something like uh, a scenario where you have to spend one clue at a time to do a thing, you could very easily put that clue on your asset and then immediately spend it. And then you can put a clue on that asset again. Otherwise you're going to need to have multiple science and tool assets to keep using that free triggered ability. Well, what would a scientist be without some science cards? And we got a handful of them in the announcement article, uh, starting with the chemistry set, a zero XP two cost asset with an intellect icon, 
item tool and sign trade it, and it takes up the accessory slot, which is a little funny, but it's worth saying that accessory slot isn't just things you hang around your neck, it's accessories. Um, it has an action ability, you exhaust it to investigate, and if you fail by exactly two, you have to discard the chemistry set, you succeed by exactly zero, you gain two resources, you succeed by exactly two, you draw one card, and you succeed by exactly four, you discover one additional clue at your location. I think this card is very interesting and I have no idea what this means for kind of a seeker archetype because we don't really have a lot of seeker cards that let you manipulate exactly how much you're going to succeed by and this potentially is kind of a do nothing if you succeed by one or by three or by 20. Right, you have to hit exactly zero, two, or four, which is not easy, even though, you know, passing the test is not necessarily the hard part, it's getting to exactly that number. Oh, and I do want to mention, normally I would throw up, like, other cards to compare this with, because there's so much in this video, I'm gonna be kind of rushing through it, and as such, I haven't put as many other cards to compare it to. In here, I'm just going to go talk to the cards and give my first impressions. I might come back to them later, especially because Kate, we have so much of her. Already, I might be able to play her just on TTS for a bit. And if so, I will be talking about these cards in more depth. Anyway, moving on, we have the Microscope, another <laughs> zero XP, two cost asset with an intellect icon. Uh, item tool and science traded. You can tell that this is definitely a, a thing they want to push in this uh, expansion. And... Worth saying that Kamani Jones is an investigator that hasn't... A lot of people felt that their uh, deck building didn't really help them, you know, the tool stuff. We may be getting a lot of tools in this expansion, so maybe that's something that they put on there knowing that a lot more tool cards were coming. Uh, and it has a reaction. After an investigator, or sorry, after an enemy at your location is successfully evaded or defeated, you can exhaust the microscope to put a resource on it as evidence. Now, that immediately sets up a number of bells in my head. Uh, obviously, it, I just mentioned Kamani. They want to evade enemies, so they're going to put evidence on this a lot. And Daryl Simmons likes having evidence. So both of those investigators, I'm immediately like, oh, maybe they're interested in this. And then it has this very unique ability, action, action to investigate. So this is a double action to investigate, and you get plus one intellect for this investigation for each evidence on microscope to a max of plus three intellect. So assuming you've been able to build this up a little, you can have a pretty big intellect boost. If you succeed, you may spend up to two evidence to discover that many additional clues at your location. So assuming you have at least two evidence on this microscope by the time you use this ability, you can get three clues for two actions. And I really like that as a balancing factor Fingerprint kit is just something you spend a lot of money on and then once per turn you can get extra clues. And seeker cards like Deduction can get you extra clues, Wing, uh, Working a Hunch can get you clues fast. But I feel this is a lot more balanced by it being a double action. Not a lot of decks are going to be able to do two actions out of their three action turn without giving up something else. Maybe you're playing Ursula and after you move you get a free action to investigate so you spend one of your normal actions on top of the bonus action you get from Ursula, and this is a little easier to use, but there's a lot of nuance in this being a double action, and I really like that. Getting three clues is very powerful. I expect at three player and four player tables, this card will see play. Solo or two player, maybe not as much, you know? Two actions to get two clues is not as good as two actions to get three clues, that's for sure. And then finally, we have Dr. Charles West three. Three or four, three, right, no, I know Roman numerals. Uh, he knows his purpose, and I want to point out this is one of the FFG uh, employee five-year arts. Uh, if you don't know, uh, when somebody works at FFG for five years, they get to get a piece of art commissioned for a card in one, in one of their games. So this is a person who works at FFG, and that makes the art so much better to me. Like, it's already pretty great, but it's so much, like, it's fantastic. It's Dr. Milan having a really, like, <laughs> maybe having done some drugs. Anyway, it's a 3 cost, 0 XP, Seeker asset with intellect and combat icons. He's ally in science traded and he takes up the ally slot. Uh, you have an additional hand slot, which can only be used to hold tool assets. Very nice. We, we've already seen a bunch of tool cards. This guy helps us carry our tools. Competing with a lot of very good Seeker cards, I'll admit. But, you know, that's a powerful extra slot effect. And after you exactly, or after you successfully investigate by exactly one or three, exhaust him to deal one damage to an enemy at your location. 
I actually think this effect is pretty reasonable. It's tricky because for the same reasons that chemistry set is tricky, right? We need to succeed by an exact amount, which we can't necessarily reliably do. And in the past, this kind of effect has been on Alice Luxley, which wasn't considered very highly. But I think this being in Seeker, which is much more likely to be the one investigating, I think this will see play. I think maybe this is just a card for Scarlet Keys, because I know Alice Luxley in Scarlet Keys has been fantastic. Uh, the extra pings can expose those uh, mini cards. Maybe this will see more play. I think if tool cards are useful enough, and we already have a lot of very good tool cards, I think it's worth considering this guy. The only thing that I kind of wish he had was the Miskatonic traits, because there is the Miskatonic archaeology funding, which gives you two extra ally slots, but can only use for Miskatonic allies. The fact that this guy is probably going to have to take up your main ally slot or require charisma is, I think, the biggest strike against them. I do think it's a, a very cool design and very, like, focused on, hey, you want to have tools and you want to be where the action is, which is nice. Uh, now, we also have a new unidentified card, the Ravenous My Myconid, Mechanid. Uh, another two cost, zero XP asset. It's an identified trait and it's agility icon. It is a creature. It is a monster. It is flora and it is science trait. It's limit one per deck. Worth noting, we've had one other limit one per deck unidentified card so far, I think. That was the Oh, what is it called? Edge of the Earth. The the gateway. The the card with all the ley lines. You know the one I mean. Uh, this is only one per deck. That does influence the card, especially because creature, monster, and flora traits are not traits I expect you to be able to search your deck for. Science, maybe. We may get a card to let you search up a science card. So you're going to have to dig pretty heavily to find this card if it's the only copy in your deck. And then it has an action to search your bonded cards for uncanny growth and add it to your hand. So like we've seen before, uh, bonded cards are back and this is an unidentified card with a bonded card. And like we saw with the Dream, uh, not the Dream, excuse me, the Dream Diary, that is often going to mean that the upgraded version also uses the same bonded card, but gives additional abilities to that card. And before we read the last ability, let's just uh, read the Uncanny Growth, which is a one-cost event, doesn't have any icons, but it is inside and science traded. It is bonded to the Ravenous Myconet, uh, my which is importantly, doesn't care about the subtype. So again, if you upgrade this, it's probably going to remain bonded to that card. And you investigate. After this test resolves, place one resource on the Ravenous Myconet as growth for each point you succeeded by. You set this card back aside out of play, so it is bonded again. You can pull it back out, and if you fail, you return this to your hand. So that's kind of nice. You don't have to keep spending the action to pull this back if you keep failing. If you succeed, you get growth counters. What do these growth counters do? Well, so far, all we know is that if it has three or more growth counters on it, you can move all those growth counters to your resource pool as resources and record in your campaign log that you have classified a new species. It also has one health and one sanity, which is kind of interesting. This is a slotless asset. I don't think this is going to be like some kind of new meta where everybody's playing this just for soak, but it is worth pointing out that you can just hurt the plant. Anyway, if I had to guess, uh, there's definitely going to be, I think, an upgrade that lets you get the uncanny growth for free. Like, I think the upgraded versions are going to get this added to your hands uh, cheaply, and then you can spend those growth counters to probably do damage or get clues, maybe move or play stuff for free. I think there's a lot of potential for these kinds of uh, unidentified cards that have bonded cards because the bonded cards basically just is you care about investigating and succeeding by a lot. And then you put those counters on the original card, but that original card can be variations on a certain kind of effect that spend those growth counters. I think it's a very neat design and I look forward to seeing what the upgraded versions do. Finally, we have one more card in the Seeker, which is a skill card, well-funded, zero XP, has a single wild icon to begin with, and it is fortune traded. While you control a science or tool asset, it gains a wild icon, and while you control three or more science and or tool asset, it gains double wild icon instead. I think this card is fine. I don't think this card is amazing. I think people have already rightfully pointed out that if you have a single science or tool asset, this is Unexpected Courage, which is not a card that a lot of people are excited to play. And the fact that it might be worse than Unexpected Courage is definitely a strike against it. But on the other hand, I think 
some people are underrating it. I think having three of these assets is less difficult than maybe you think. And I think triple wild icon zero XP cards are just straight up worth playing, especially when they don't have any kind of play uh, condition. I think, you know, cards like um, the survivor synergy cards, uh, I don't remember the name, sorry, <laughs> I'm off the top of my head. Or Savant, which is the rogue skill, one XP that gets extra wild icons based on which skill you aren't testing. Those cards are just, you know, they can be very powerful. They can be very flexible is the main thing, right? When you're asked to make a test you maybe weren't prepared for, cards like that are very powerful. And I think this card is going to find a slot in at least some decks, even if that's just the campaign play along card pool. Because let's face it, I keep hosting the campaign play along and I, I expect to see cards like this in those kind of limited card pools. But that's not the only investigator we saw. And Hank Sampson's is here and he's doing something we haven't seen before. You are gonna change your investigator card in the middle of the game. Now let's start with the basic. Uh, he's assistant and warden traded and he's the farmhand and he has three willpower, one intellect, five combat, which is I think the first time we've seen that on Survivor, you know, Calvin doesn't count and very, very powerful. Immediately indicates this guy wants to fight, three agility. He's has the following abilities. You may be assigned damage or horror dealt to ally assets or other investigators at your location. And then he has a very unusual ability. When you would be defeated by damage and or horror, instead heal all of your damage and horror and swap this card with its bonded resolute version either side face up. Elder Shine effect plus one. And he starts out with five and five health and sanity, which would be kind of low, except that of course, when he gets defeated, he instead gets a full heal. So you start out with five and five, and then you swap into one of these other two forms. Now the assistant version is assistant and resolute traits, loses one combat going down to four, but gains intellect three instead of intellect one and agility four instead of agility three. So he becomes a much more well-rounded character in the process. He has the bonded, Hank Samson's, this is a bonded card, and it's double-sided, so these are the two different sides. Both sides have the ability, you cannot be healed. That's very important. Once you're on this side, you're not healing anymore. Other cards you control can still be healed, so if you want to play Jessica Hyde and Peter Sylvester, probably a good idea, but damage and horror on you, that's, uh, that's probably staying. You may be assigned damage and horror dealt to ally assets or other investigators at your location. Reaction, when one or more horror is placed on you, draw one card. And then Elder Shine effect, move one horror from Hams, uh, Hank Sampson's to an asset you control, four health, six sanity. On the other side, if you wanna have the Warden version, it still has the bonded effect, it still has the cannot be healed effect. It has reaction, when one or more damage is placed on you, gain two resources, and then as an Elder Shine effect, move one damage from him to an asset you control, six health and four sanity. But probably most notable here is his stat line, which has gone to four willpower, one intellect, six combat. This is the first time we've seen a sprinted six on an investigator, even if it is a bonded version, and still three agility. This card is really wild. If you are doing the kind of guardian style fighting, this is... This is nuts. This is so good, right? Six base combat. This guy is going to be hitting stuff for days. He is going to get resources when he gets take, when he takes damage. I mean, you can be healed, so you have to be very careful, but this, I really like this design. I think this is a very cool way to do some flexible stuff. I think early game, you still have your five combat. You have your three willpower, you have your three agility. As a survivor, those thoughts are more than sufficient to get somewhere, to do stuff, right? You have Lucky, you have live, what, uh, live and Learn, you have Look What I Found. You have this very cool team tanking ability. It's actually an ability we've seen in the Guardian card pool quite a bit, and it's one that I uh, personally also used in a survivor custom design, so very cool to see it in the game here. And this just like limit break ability is fantastic. I really like this design, I think it's really cool. Um, yeah, and it puts me in mind of uh, investigators like Daniela Reyes, like Calvin, like Tommy, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Yorick, right? Using your soaks, because survivors get good soaks, so you're, you're probably going to be fine. 
Uh, we also have a signature cards. Uh, Stout Hearted is a two cost signature event with a willpower, combat and wild icon. It is spirit traded, Hank Samson deck only, fast, play when you engage a non-elite enemy. Move up to two damage and or horror from Hank Samson to that enemy as damage. Everybody, everyone is a hero to someone. This is just a very good effect. You cannot be healed, but you can still move your damage and horror. So this is a great way, I think, to hold on to for the late game. When you are maybe getting into a, a bit of a tough spot, you can use this to both hurt an enemy and heal yourself. And that's very nice. Uh, there is also a treachery, which is very interesting for one particular reason we'll get to at the end. Uh, where's Pa is a weakness, flaw, revelation, discards cards from the top of the encounter deck until an enemy is discarded. Attach where Pa to that enemy and spawn it at a connecting location if able. And then it gets very interesting because the attached enemy gains elusive. I'm assuming this is not them just completely butchering the word aloof which means we get a new enemy keyword for this expansion. That makes sense. And I think we can kind of guess what this does. A lot of people have speculated this is probably gonna be Hunter, but kind of the inverse, right? Trying to move away from investigators, which would make sense for an effect like this. And I think it's kind of cool that they're keywording that. It makes sense to me. Uh, it also has a force effect at the end of the round, Hank Samson takes one direct horror. This is gonna be killing you very quickly. So you have to kill this enemy. I like this. I think it's a cool weakness design. Uh, it puts me in mind of Zoe's signature weakness. It just spawns an enemy that you have to deal with. But unlike Zoe, where it does a mental trauma if you cannot kill it by the end of the scenario, it puts direct horror pressure on you immediately. But it's something you just have to chase down and kill. So yeah, I think this is a, a nice card. Of course, we gotta need some tools to deal with all the problems we're taking on in this new expansion. Uh, starting off with the Pitchfork. A 3 cost, 0 XP, asset, combat and uh, agility icons, that's right. <laughs> Item, tool, weapon and melee traded. Takes up 2 hand slots. And an action, fight. You get plus 1 combat and deal plus 2 damage for this attack. If this attack is successful, lose control of Pitchfork and attach it to your location. Your location gains, action, take control of Pitchfork. Any investigator at Pitchfork's location may trigger this ability. This is a really neat weapon design. But it's actually really powerful. It deals plus two damage. Don't miss that. It is a three damage hit. This puts me in mind of Backstab, but more so of the Ornate Bow, which is a level three neutral card that also takes up two hand slots. And you can attack using agility for plus two agility and plus two damage. And then you have to spend an action to load another arrow. Now, there's a lot of cool things people have done with the Ornate Bow over time. I think it's definitely not a card that is immediately replaced by this, just by nature of the fact that that attacks with agility and this attacks with combat. But if you're looking just for a weapon that deals plus two damage once and then you have to spend an action to get it back, this is the place to be. And it's worth saying you don't lose control of the pitchfork if you miss, which is very important. Only when that attack is successful do you have to pick it back up. It is going to be action expensive. Keep in mind that this is actually dealing one and a half damage per action. But a lot of the time, the way that combat in Arkham works out, you want to kill an enemy now, and then you're okay with losing actions later if that means you've dealt with the enemy, because then you don't have to provoke text opportunity and other nasty stuff like that. The fact that other investigators can grab the pitchfork is kind of hilarious. It means that maybe if you're someone like Bob Jenkins, the item salesman guy, you play this, you hit it with it once, and then you're like, well, somebody else pick it up. I don't need it anymore. Speaking of fighting, we have a long shot. Uh, somebody's getting bricked. Uh, it is a skill card, level zero, with no icons. It's practice traded. And you may commit long shot to a fight or evasion test against an enemy at your location or collecting location. So that's important. You can do fight or evade. You don't get any icons, but it can be any test that you're performing or another investigating at your location or connecting locations performing, which is kind of wild. We haven't seen other skill cards that just let you commit to uh, other investigators at other location. And it's probably a pretty powerful ability. If this test is successful, deal one damage to that enemy. This is Vicious Blow. This is Vicious Blow that doesn't give you plus one combat, but you can use on any fight or evasion attack, even if you're not using combat. So if you're shriveling or if you are just basic evading, like this card is fantastic. And the thing that I really like about it, other than just it's 
powerful because vicious blow is powerful. It's action compression. This is more action compression. Is in one or two player, you probably want to play this because being able to do an extra damage to an enemy that you're fighting or evading is very important. In three or four player, that might get a little bit less important if you're not the designated fighter, but then the ability to toss this into somebody else's test at another location becomes way more important, right? In two player, you're not often that far apart, so that maybe isn't as big of a deal, but in three or four player, you could be a flex, right? Maybe someone like Ash Campede who might fight with Duke, but who might also be like, hey, Mr. Guardian over there, I see that you're fighting this big monster. How about I throw in a long shot and this deals an extra point of damage? So yeah, I think this card is very well designed. I think it's a very powerful effect and I expect to see this all over the place. And finally, we have Push to the Limit, a two cost survivor event, zero XP, willpower and combat icon tactic traded. Um, Mark can take this. And improvised, choose a weapon or tool asset in your discard pile. Choose an, resolve an action ability on that asset, ignoring all costs. After this effect resolves, shuffle a chosen asset into your deck. Playing this card does not provoke a text opportunity. Now, somebody already compared this to Knowledge's Power, and I think that's not an unfair comparison, but I also think it's slightly different in this case, right? The important thing here is you need to get the weapon or tool asset into your discard pile, and just in basic, the ability to get a free use out of weapon or tool asset, as opposed to spell or what's the other trait on, on the, a tome? Tome or, uh, is is pretty different. The other thing is that this does actually take up an action, as opposed to knowledge is power, which is fast. So yeah, there's there's a couple of limiting factor. I don't I don't disagree that this is a very powerful effect though. Uh, recursion is always powerful, and it's actually kind of interesting that in Survivor, this is putting the card back into your deck. So you might want it in your discard pile, right? You might want to scavenge it. No, you have to get it back at that point. But this is very powerful, right? If we have, you know, a pitchfork in our discard pile, being able to deal two, uh, deal three damage attack out of nowhere when we need to is very good. And the flexibility on cards like this is almost always very strong. I do believe that you would not put the pitchfork on your location. It would just get shoveled into your deck in case anybody's wondering. And then a couple of kind of weirder, stranger cards. Um, the Sparrow Mask, the Wanderer's Companion, is a one cost zero XP survivor asset with willpower and agility icons. It is item charm and mask traded. We have seen masks before in the standalone expansion, the Carnival of Horrors. And all the masks in that expansion have the limit one mask per investigator rule, but we haven't seen any masks since then. So that hasn't really mattered, but now it looks like it might matter. And honestly, I'm expecting that this expansion will have at least one mask perfection, maybe multiple. So what does it actually do? Well, it uses two offerings and you replenish one of these offerings after you take one or more damage and or horror. This is very interesting. We've seen this kind of replenishing effect before in other cards, but usually those are just start of the round. This only replenishes when you take damage or horror, but it is still a potentially limitless use uh, uses effect, assuming you can keep taking damage and horror. And then as a free trigger, you can spend an offering to get plus two willpower or plus two agility for a skill test, limit once per test. This card is very strong. I just want to put that out there. You might only want to run a single copy if you're playing a survivor deck, you might not want to run both, but I think this card is pretty strong even if you're not expecting to take a lot of damage or horror, just I think if you if you trigger this effect three times in a game, you're already like pretty happy with it because these are the treachery protection stats, right? These are the, the stats you expect on encounter cards. And just being able to go, I get plus two on this is really good. I just like this this card just seems very strong. And I'm also thinking of like Patrice, right? Not at all because she's on the art of the third card. We'll, we'll get to it. But the idea that you know you put one of these down, you're doing all the spell casting stuff, and then you take a damage horror or Agnes. If you're Agnes, you just get plus two willpower on a otherwise basically slotless card, right? Keep in mind, masks is a it's sort of a slot, right? It's it's like footwear, it is a slot but not a slot. But the thing here is just like you want this card. I think you I think this card is good. I think this card is very good. The fact that it's an item you can regard it's this card bone cards. Uh, next up, like we have wrong place, right time, a zero cost, zero XP survivor event with willpower 
agility and wild icons. This card has strong icons and it's probably because it is very situational. Uh, it is a spirit and it is double traded. And what that means is that as an additional cost to play this card, you have to spend an action. So far, we've seen two doubles, this and Refine from the previous expansion, and they both cost an extraction. This is also something that was in Netrunner, so it makes sense. It's just a similar mechanic. What does the card actually do for those two actions? Well, you move up to five damage and or horror from your investigator to assets controlled by investigators at your location. For each asset defeated by this effect, draw a card, and then you remove wrong place, right time from the game. This is obviously a Hank card because you don't want to just completely get uh, defeated and you can no longer get healed, so you need to get your damage and horror off you somehow. But I also just love this as a Tommy card, right? Tommy is often running a lot of assets, but maybe you're taking direct damage and horror. I know in Dunwich I've had a very bad time when the... Oh, I don't remember. Light of something or rather. It's, it turns all damage and horror into direct damage and horror. Playing Tommy through that is miserable because not only are you suddenly taking away the damage you were expecting to soak, it also means that your ability to get resources is suddenly turned off. This card just basically goes, well, I'm going to heal five and probably draw one or two cards and make a bunch of money as Tommy. I think this card is very potent in a very specific style of deck. And I expect that if you are in that kind of deck, you're going to want this card and otherwise you're not interested at all. But yeah, this is, a, this is a neat effect. And then finally, we can now stall for time. It is a one cost, zero XP survivor event, willpower and intellect icons. It is a tactic and trick, and you can parlay. Choose an enemy at your location to test the willpower X where X is the chosen enemy's fight or evade value, whichever is lower. If you succeed, exhaust, from the, chosen, exhaust the chosen enemy, but do not disengage from it. If it is non-elite, it does not ready during the next upkeep phase. And then the very important line, if you fail, return stall for time to your hand. Now this card isn't actually as good. I, I think it's awesome art and kind of interesting text, but a lot of the time survivors are fine taking basic evades. However, there might be another investigator in this expansion who wants to take these kinds of tests. We'll get to her in a moment. But the idea here basically is you get a double evade, but instead of evading, you're parlaying. I think this is neat. I think it's fine. I think it requires a specific kind of deck to work, but I think it potentially could work. The fact that on fill you get it back is very nice out of fill protection. It means you maybe don't have to commit into this card as much as you normally would. But that's not all, because everything I've talked about so far have been all the new cards in the new uh, article, but FFG also put up their store page, and store page gave us a little bit more very exciting news. First of all, I want to say, totally called it, because we know Bless and Curse are coming back. The Feast of Hemlockville Investigator expansion features five new investigators for Arkham Horror, the card game, blah, 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 blah including brand new bond cards and cards that make use of bless and curse tokens. This is something that I expected would be in this expansion for a long time, far before we knew that this expansion was coming, simply because if you looked at the multi-class cards, we first saw multi-class cards in the Circle Undone, and then they came back in the Edge of the Earth. And we know from interviews that Maxine and other people have talked about that FVG they're always working ahead, right? They're not working on this cycle up until January. They finished this cycle probably over a year ago. But because of the way that design and development and then production actually takes, it takes a while before these cards are able to come out. And that means that there's a delay between when they get feedback on these cards from the player base and when they're actually able to put, those, put that feedback into a new set. And... Because Innsmouth was two cycles after uh, Circle Undone, I expected that two cycles after Edge of the Earth, we would see the return of Blessing Curse. Because it is my opinion that Blessing Curse is a very cool mechanic that just needs more cards. It just needs way more cards to flesh out archetypes, to make more diverse decks possible. I think Bless in general works quite well. I think most of the Bless payoffs are good. I think a lot of the Bless generation works. I think Guardian is maybe done a little dirty. Survivor is very strong, but otherwise that's fine. Curse hasn't landed, I think, where I personally want it, and I would suspect FFG wants it, mostly because a lot of the Curse payoffs in Seeker 
kind of fail to deliver. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of secret cards that do stuff when you have curse tokens that don't weigh up to the cost of having that many curse tokens. And the effect that add curse tokens to the bag tend to be better if you don't use too many of them. So I think there's a balance there that they haven't quite gotten right. And I hope that this time they'll you know they'll they'll show off really what blessing curse can do. And I think it's really exciting. It also showcases all five investigators for this expansion, which is kind of wild. We maybe knew, no, we definitely didn't know what the five investigators in the last expansion were gonna be at this time. And it's kind of wild that we already know who the five are and we know the text of four of them, or at least we can speculate pretty heavily on the text of four of them. So the guardian is gonna be Wilson Richard, which is a recurring, a returning character from previous Arkham games. And in this iteration, he is a guardian with 3333 stat line, which is kind of unusual. Uh, 3333 stat lines haven't historically been the most popular, but he does have some abilities that I think compensate for that. And as a guardian, it's actually kind of interesting. It might be hints that he's more flexible than historical guardians. The text here is speculation. I want to point that out. We don't have a picture clearer than what I am posting here. So, it could very well be that this is wrong, but I'm going to suspect that the text says, reduce the research cost of the first tool asset you play each round by one. It might be by more than one because we cannot see the number, but it makes sense to me that it would be a, a one resource reduction, which means that this is another character that cares about tool cards, which again, to me makes sense that Kamani got tools less cycle. That was just a kind of a preview, a tease for a bunch of tool-based investigators in this cycle because Kate cares about it and Wilson cares about it and Hank also got a bunch of tools. Wilson additionally gets plus one skill value during skill tests on tool assets. So that's where I think the 333 stat line is less punishing than normal. If you are fighting using a tool card, you are now at four combat. If you are investigating using a flashlight, which is a tool, you are at four intellect. If you are somehow doing a tool thing with agility or willpower, you are at four. And this is not the first time per round. This is just plus one anytime. I think this plays into Guardians being the assets and specifically board building state where they want to have the right tools for the job. And I think Wilson is actually kind of an interesting take on that. I think it, it to me, plays nicely into the Guardian card pool. I've always felt that Guardian got too many cards to boost their combat for investigators that already generally had very good combat. And so this is kind of nice. Putting those stop points somewhere else means he's a lot more flexible, but I don't think he's going to have any trouble getting his combat to the right numbers. I think the main challenge you're facing with him is going to be finding out which weapons, which aren't tools are worth playing, or if you're just playing specifically tool weapons. We also don't know his deck building yet. Uh, he has eight health, but we don't know how much sanity he has, but we can kind of speculate on his Elder Shine effect. It is a plus zero, and you may replace a tool asset in play with a tool asset in your hand with equal or lower cost. Very neat, not something I know, I think you necessarily build around, but it's worth saying that if your tool has limited uses, something like a flashlight, this gives you a free refill. I kind of love it. I think this is a, a cool take on a Guardian and I, I'm excited to see if this is indeed which direction they're taking Wilson. And then we also have Alessandra Zorzi. Please excuse me if that's not how you pronounce that. I know she's from one of the books, like one of the novellas that FFG put out, or maybe straight up a novel. Um, it's the Nexus of Nakai, right? It's the Nakai, uh, Wrath of Nakai, I think the book is called. Uh, she's in there and she's the Countess. Uh, she has a 3324 stat line. Uh, sorry, 3424 is that line. Excuse me, I, I made a typo here, uh, which actually kind of noteworthy because it is one more skill point than you normally would see on a stat line. Normally they add up to 12, as we can see with Wilson and with Kate, uh, but hers actually adds up to 13, which leans into what I suspect her deck building will be. We'll get into that in a moment because her ability is you may take an additional action during your turn, which can only be used to parlay. So this is an additional action investigator that cares about parlays. And we haven't had a designated parlay investigator yet. Uh, so it's kind of exciting to see what we'll do. And this is why I think her deck building may be rogue zero to five, neutral zero to five, and then cards that parlay some number, probably at least a couple of levels. Because we've seen in the past with investigators like Akachi or Mark, 
who were both their main class and then no rule off class other than a single trait, it will make sense that Alexandra is similar but just cares about cards that parlay. Her Elder Sign is a plus two. If you succeed choosing non-elite enemy at your location or a revealed connecting location, automatically evade that enemy and she has seven health and seven sanity. I suspect that she's going to care about keeping enemies alive, keeping them around, which is a theme that we've seen in Rogue before. And yeah, she's going to parlay with them. I think this is super neat. I think it's a cool new direction for the faction and it is going to be something that I'm excited to try out. Finally, and this is an investigator I really don't know how to pronounce, so please excuse me. I think Ko Kohaku Nurikami, Nurukami uh, is going to be the mystic for this faction. I believe this is a new character to the Mythos, uh, so I really don't know what to make of him. 4-4-3-1 um, four, four, stat line, not a 5 willpower, but 4 intellect on mystic is actually kind of nice. Uh, I really appreciate that on... Marie and not Luke, Lucas 3, uh, Gloria. Which is important actually because some people suspected Gloria would be released in this box. Gloria is not in the box. However, if you look very carefully, and you're probably not going to watch it in this video, but if you go to the FG store page, find this image yourself, and zoom in like really closely, you can actually get kind of a sense of what his traits are because his entire text box is covered, but you can get a sense of the traits. And people have speculated that he is the his traits are Scholar, Blessed, and Cursed, which could make him a designated Blessed Curse Mystic. We didn't get one of those in Innsmouth, we got Dexter Drake, and they haven't told us anything about Blessed or Cursed yet, other than this little blurb on the website, which I kind of wonder if that was a mistake, if marketing hadn't intended for us to know that Blessed and Curse would be in this cycle, and they wanted to do a big reveal later. Either way, with the four other investigators basically revealed in more or less and not talking about Blessing Curse at all, it makes sense to me that the final investigator is the one that really cares about Blessing Curse. I'm very excited to see what they'll do. I think it is a cool character. Uh, he's the fol folklorist, folklorist, which is a cool archetype for a mistake. And honestly, I'm here for it. I'm excited to see what they'll do. Like, I have no idea, but you know, I'm excited. All right, so that's all that we know about the Hemlock Vale. But since I haven't done a video about Susie or Parallel uh, Ashken yet, I'm just going to talk about them real quickly. Uh, I haven't really done anything with them, which is the main reason I hadn't done a video yet. I wanted to try them out for myself and kind of experiment before I did uh, a video on them, but I really just haven't had a chance. But since I'm recording this video now, I'm going to do it and maybe I'll circle back to them at a later time. So subject 5U21, aka Susie, is the anomaly. Uh, she's manifold traded and she's a reference to the blob that ate everything, obviously. Uh, if you like Arkham to be a little bit more serious, then Susie's probably not for you. But if you like Arkham being a little goofy sometimes, being a little over the top, being a little pulp, as people usually refer to it, then she's fantastic. And I think she makes a lot of sense for maybe running her through a campaign once or twice and not being a main line investigator, right? She's not going to get put into a, an expansion, but she's a cool effect to print and play. Uh, her ability, you begin uh, the game with Ravenous Controlled Hunger in play. This is a permanent asset we'll get to in a minute. And during each upkeep phase, you draw an additional card and then devour a non-weakness player card in your hand. Devour was a mechanic in the blob that ate everything. In that one, it was clearly an encounter card effect. But since we are now playing as sort of the blob, we definitely get to devour stuff ourselves. And she has a free trigger ability to devour a non-story card controlled by an investigator at your location. Limit once per round. And then an Elder Shine effect, plus two. After this test ends, you may add a devoured card to its owner's hand. So we can regurgit regurgitate devoured cards. She also has six health, six sanity, and a 1-1-1-1 one, 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 one stat line. However, Ravenous comes in to save us because it is a we start on the controlled hunger side. And it is a talent for her only permanent. Each time you devour a card, place it face down beneath Ravenous. You get plus one to each of your skills for each card beneath Ravenous to a maximum of plus five. So she starts out as a one, 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 but very quickly she's going to devour cards and get stronger and stronger, right? For every card beneath it, her stats go up. So it's not that hard to get her to three, 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 four, 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 four 
And then it gets tricky because once she gets to 6666, which is the maximum allowed by Ravenous, you gotta flip, her, flip Ravenous over. At which point your hunger has become uncontrolled. It is a flaw weakness. Uh, each time you devour a card, set it aside out of play. You still get plus one to each of your skills uh, for each card beneath low Ravenous, but importantly, the cards you are devouring are now no longer going below Ravenous, they are now getting set aside out of play. So that means you stop being able to re re return those cards as easily. At the end of the turn, you have to devour a non-story card beneath Ravenous or control by an investigated location. So you are going to lose those cards, they're going to get set aside presumably for the rest of the scenario. If there's nothing beneath Ravenous, you can flip it back over. So you lose control of the Ravenous for a little bit, but you also depower yourself as you do so because you start losing the cards underneath and then at some point you flip it back over. Fortunately, she does have some signature cards that can help with this. Regurgitation is a zero cost event with a wild icon that is a power. You fast play it only during your turn if it is uncontrolled, you flip it over. So you get to, you just get to go back to your controlled side and you get to uh, flip your weakness, which is kind of nice. Choose and return up to three cards you devoured, beneath Ravenous or set aside, so the cards are not lost forever, and you return them to their owner's hands. For each card returned this way, heal the damage or horror. This is a very nice power. I kind of like it. I think it is just fundamental to her toolkit to need to have an effect like this because you can't really play her if you're not able to control uh, returning some of the cards you have to devour. But then there is also Reality Asset, uh, which is a treachery card from the... Uh, from Blood and Everything, that is now your weakness. If Ravenous Controlled Hunger is face up, flip it over. You are now uncontrollably hungry. You devour a random aspect of reality. Reveal a random chaos token from the chaos back in the consult the reality assets reference card to determine what you devoured. I will point out it is a different reference card than the one that is in the blob that ate everything. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to list the entire reference card here. If you want to play with her, go to the FFG website. There will be links in the description. I think she's super cool. Uh, her deck building was released, I think, just in the Discord. There might have been, it might have been posted in other places. Um, she's going to be a thing for people going to Gen Con, I believe. You can get her printed out at Gen Con, but she's also just going to be available for print and play after that on the website. And her deck building is absolutely wild. She is a 50 card deck size, which makes sense because during her upkeep, you're going to draw extra cards. So you need to have this kind of steady stream of cards. You're going to see a lot of them, but you're also going to be devouring a bunch of them. And her deck building options are neutral cards 0 to 5 and cards from any class level 0. So she starts out being able to take anything from level 0, but she doesn't get to spend XP on anything outside of neutral. Her deck building requirements are Ravenous, her permanent, 3 copies of Regurgitation, 3 copies of Reality Asset, so 3 of her signature, but also 3 of her signature weakness, and 2 random basic weaknesses. You basically have 2 decks worth of cards in your deck if you're playing Suzy. Which is kind of cool. I kind of love it. You have an extra basic weakness. That's fine. She has a deck building restriction. No permanence except for story and signature permanence. I'm fine with this. I I like that this doesn't make her strictly better than Lola. I think Lola Hayes is a investigator who's been done a lot better now that she's been. Uh, she has a taboo version that is a little bit less punishing. And I like that this makes it that if you want to do cool permanent things with cards like another day another dollar or studious or the permanent from the edge of the earth cycle you gotta stick with lola you cannot just go into susie because susie can take everything lola is a little bit more restricted and uh, susie also has an additional restriction your deck must have at least seven cards from each class so you're gonna have seven guardian cards seven seeker cards seven rogue cards seven mystic cards and seven survivor cards in your deck this all makes her very complicated to deck build, which is one of the reasons why I haven't played with her yet. Uh, finally, her upgrade options are absolutely fantastic. After each scenario ends, separate each card you devoured by class. Before the next scenario in this campaign, you may spend experience to purchase or upgrade one or more cards of any level from the class with the most of our cards. If there's a tie, choose one. So the way that her deck building upgrading works is she can actually take 
zero to five from anything, but she has to devour the right guards first. If she devours all the guardian cards, she's going to become more guardian. If she devours more rogue cards, she becomes more rogue. Thematically, this is so wonderful. And gameplay wise, I might be a nightmare. I don't care. I love it. I think this is such a cool, weird thing to add to the game. I think it's super cute. I think it's super fun. I really want to thank, especially Maxine, because I know this is secretly the last thing she worked on. She said that it was Curl Keys, but this was something that she had her hands on. This is such a cool farewell gift. And I'm really excited to try her at least once. I think it's just like, it's fun, it's goofy, but it's also fantastic. And I love it. And then we have Ash and Pete. He's back. Uh, yes, they have confirmed that they're going to be doing more parallel investigators, starting with Ash and Pete. But I would be very surprised if we didn't see investigators for all the other Dunwich Gators as well. Because let's face it, those are investigators who haven't really been as exciting this uh, this long into the game, right? They were the first cycle released after the core set, and a lot of them have mechanics and especially deck building rules that are kind of lame compared to modern deck uh, investigators. So uh, our new version of the Drifter is a four willpower, two intellect, three combat, which I believe is one higher than normal, and three agility. And you begin the game with Pete's guitar in play. As a reaction, when a card you own that is attached to a scenario card would be discarded, add it to your hand instead. This is a trap-based investigator. This is an investigator who cares about manipulating enemies with the various traps in the game. And that's why those uh, cards that are attached to your to enemies, to locations, stuff like that, you get to add them back to your hand. And as an elder sign, effect plus one, choose a card you own, attached to a scenario card, you may return the chosen card to your hand. Come here, boy, we got work to do. Seven health and seven sanity. Which is important. The original Ashcan had a lower health and sanity, but started the game with Duke in play, who had health and sanity. Pete's guitar does not have health and sanity, so you're going to need to have a little bit more health than the only investigator. And this instrument is a two-cost asset, but if you start with it in play, you don't have to pay the cost. It is a replacement. Now, this is very important. We've seen changes to signature cards in the parallel investigator before, but those used the advanced keyword, not the replacement keyword. The rules for these have been seen before in the book version of investigators but they are very different and i'll get to that in a second but it basically means that this is an alternative set to duke this is not a upgrade you do this is a different set and in order to take it you also need to take the hard times weakness the guitar itself has a free trigger to exhaust it choose a non-elite enemy at your location or connecting location move that enemy once in the direction of your choice then if there are no enemies at your location either heal one horror or gain one resource it's important to note you can only activate this ability if you have an enemy in play. So you need to keep at least one enemy alive in order to use this ability if you just want to use it to gain one resource per turn, which is pretty powerful. And this is again leaning into this idea that Pete is manipulating enemy movement and using traps to deal with enemies. There was a makeshift trap in the Scarlet Keys, which is one of the customizable cards, which is very powerful with this investigator. But there are things like Snare Trap going back, I think, all the way to the Corset or maybe to Dunwich that haven't really had a home and a designated trap investigator yet, which we now have. Unfortunately, Pete can also fall in hard times. It is a signature weakness, replacement, revelation, put it into play in your threat area, and after you draw one or more cards, choose and discard that many cards from hand, double action, clear hard times. I think this is a very neat weakness design. Uh, original Ash and Pete had a lot of discard-based synergies, right? You wanted the discard cards. And so I don't necessarily think that this is as punishing in him as it is in a lot of other investigators, but it is the kind of card that you're going to have to just double action clear. And it just kind of depends on how you want to, how much time you want to spend before you can spend that double action. Because it basically stops you from drawing additional cards. You're going to be stuck with the cards you have or with the number of cards you have when you draw this, but you might be able to swap out certain cards if you draw a card that you need more than the cards you have in hand right now. Now, the important thing about replacement is that you can use either version of the signatures with either of the investigators, or you can use both. You are allowed to bring both Duke and the guitar in your deck. The only thing that is important about that is you have to bring both the set of the weaknesses. So you have an extra weakness in your deck. 
The other thing that's important is to keep in mind that you do not get to start the game in play with Duke if you're bringing the parallel version of Ash Camp Pete. However, inversely, you do have this very powerful uh, uh, Duke in your deck and you get to start with the guitar in play. You can also put Pete's guitar into an original Ash Camp Pete deck, which again, it doesn't start in play, but you start with Duke in play. And then you can draw into the guitar and use it if you want to. So which way you go on that really depends on which kind of other ability you want, right? Ash Compete has this, or the parallel version of Ash Compete has this kind of trap-based scenario card attachment effect. Original Ash Compete lets you discard cards to ready assets, which works on the guitar. If you want to get more resources and you're just chucking out that winging it, I've done it in Patrice a million times. I would be happy to do it in Ash Compete. So I think that this parallel version adds a lot by not adding that much, but simply giving us the option to bring both of these signatures into the same deck. You're gonna have to contend with extra weaknesses, but there are ways around that and we'll work that out. And I think this is a very cool design. I think, yeah, I've just been generally very happy with all the parallel designs so far. And I think this is just another great hit in a list of great hits. That's it. Uh, my voice is probably gone by now. It's been an hour. Uh, so sorry if this video was super long. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're all caught up on all the FFG news now. Please let me know in the comments if you got this far, which card are you most excited to play? There's a lot of cards in here and especially I'm, I'm curious about which investigators people are very hyped for. But if you just saw a different card that you're just very excited for, please let me know in the comments. Uh, if there are specific cards or investigators you would like me to play on this channel, also let me know that because I will be looking at those to look at what videos I'll be making next. So thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you until the end of time.